Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Why Can't We Be Friends? Kubernetes in a Zone-Based Architecture World. So before I hand over the webinar to our presenter, uh, I have a few housekeeping items to go through with you and uh, about the presentation questions and the webinar platform in general. So first off, today's webinar will be available on demand pretty much immediately after the live session is over. It takes about typically 15 to 20 minutes. So uh, if you want to go back and look at it again, you can. Um, and also, we'd really love to hear from you today. Questions are, are very important to us. It makes a much better uh, presentation if we have a, a dialogue back and forth. Um, we're going to have two Q&A sessions. So, um, so our, preventer, our presenter, Eddie, is going to go through uh, some of the presentation. And right before a demo, we'll stop. And we will take questions. And so if you have questions along the way, just type them in as, as you feel them. And then when we get to that Q&A session, we'll address them. Uh, he's then going to do a demo. And then we will do some more slides. And then we'll have a Q&A at the end, where we can take any questions we missed the first time and uh, answer any new questions. So um, that being said, let's go ahead and talk about our presenter. So I would like to introduce to you uh, your speaker, Eddie Esquivel. So um, Eddie is a senior solutions engineer here at Tigera. He has worked in technology for the last 20 years, first actually as a developer. And was that in the, in the baking industry, Eddie? Is that, is that, do I remember that correctly? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And um, over the last few years, he's been focused uh, in the Kubernetes space with experience at CoreOS and, and now here with us at Tigera. And in his spare time, he enjoys exploring New York City with his wife. So without further ado, I will hand the presentation over to Eddie. And uh, you're, in, you're in his capable hands, and we'll have a great presentation. So enjoy. Great. Thanks, Michael, for that intro. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get started with the presentation here. Uh, the first thing I wanted to uh, discuss was this notion of a zone-based architecture. And uh, essentially, essentially, a zone-based architecture uh, as we know it uh, in the data center, well, it's going to have a few zones. There's going to be uh, the zone that describes the front-end apps that maybe have access to the internet. There may be a middle tier uh, zone where you, you stick uh, kind of the business logic, and then you know the uh, you know, the, the treasures of the kingdom, so to speak, are in the restricted zone. And, and these are generally the best practices for uh, a data center today, right? And it gives you some definite benefits, right? For example, it allows you to establish boundaries between the applications, allows you to detect any, you know, any sort of traffic that goes between the firewalls. So you're going to be able to have visibility into that. And last but not least, you're going to be able to limit the fire, uh, you know, the blast radius if there is going to be a breach of any sort. So uh, fairly well understood um, network best practices in the data center, um, uh, as highlighted here by this graphic. So you know, when we talk about zone visibility, uh, the zone visibility really comes by virtue of the firewall, right? So you're able to uh, see the firewall. Uh, intra zone visibility. Uh, we'll see people go ahead and try to hairpin traffic, all traffic, uh, back to the firewall. Uh, with the migration to the cloud, we're starting to see people perhaps try to rethink uh, different aspects of the application, um, how they've architected it, maybe going from a monolithic application to microservices. Uh, but one of the interesting things is that, by and large, the network um, paradigm or architecture that we've been used to on-prem hasn't changed all that much, right? So for example, if I take a look at a, a, some, some screenshots here from various cloud provider documentations, you know, if we take a look at this AWS screenshot, similar zone-based architecture. You got VPCs for the front end, you got blue-green deployment, and then VPCs that kind of firewall off any sort of traffic. Um, likewise for Azure, very similar network architecture diagram here. And even Google, um, you know, is getting into the game with zone-based architecture. Right? So this is 
uh, what typically people are trying to do in the cloud. And again, as, as was uh, mentioned earlier, there are some key benefits, uh, not the least of which is containment, right? And, you know, some type of visibility in terms of uh, interactions between the network zones. Um, but guess what? Uh, we're obviously going to discuss Kubernetes today. Kubernetes kind of uh, puts a huge gap in that architecture, uh, you know, not the least of which is the fact that we're dealing with dynamic IPs, right? So trying to create firewall-based rules where you have, you know, at a basic level, one static IP commuting, communicating to another static IP, that paradigm isn't really going to fly in a Kubernetes world. Uh, again, uh, dynamic IPs just do not lend themselves to what we've traditionally been doing uh, on-prem and even to some degree in the cloud. Uh, there's very little visibility within the zone uh, of a Kubernetes cluster. If you really wanted to leverage firewall zones, uh, you're going to have to plug or punch huge wide IP ranges in the firewall uh, through these different network zones. Uh, you're still going to be limited by the visibility that you may or may not get within the zone. So firewalls, by and large, um, don't really apply to Kubernetes. Another key uh, issue that we'll see is, for example, if you need to have access to an external service, maybe AWS, RDS, you know, maybe it's a Snowflake a database or something, it really becomes an all or nothing proposition. All your pods in your Kubernetes cluster have access to it, or none of them do, right? So uh, firewalls uh, are a bit tough, a bit challenging within the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, what we once had uh, in a traditional environment uh, in terms of visibility really gets limited, right? So enforcing policies uh, between network zones gets a bit hairy, right, when you're de dealing with these dynamic IPs. You may get some logging and event correlation, uh, but it's certainly not going to be enough to satisfy even the most lax of CISOs out there. So. Is there a better approach? And I, I think at this point in the in the conversation, it's, uh, I love highlighting an epiphany uh, that I had when I read this book called The Grassland uh, back in college many years ago. And, and the book was basically making a point that, hey, uh, you know, we're decimating our ecosystem in the Midwest, the grassland ecosystem, and that is uh, due in large part to uh, all this cattle that we've placed on the grassland. Um, you know, the way a cow eats the grass basically pulls it out of the, from the root and doesn't allow the grass to regrow. Uh, and the book made this interesting observation. You know, we, we killed 100 million bison to put 100 million cows in the grass, and why don't we just rethink the problem and, and, and wonder if maybe bison were, you know, were tasty and we could eat bison instead of having to replace the two. Right, it's an interesting epiphany. But the similar epiphany, I, I think, is merited for the conversation we're having here about Kubernetes, right? Okay, so we're moving to Kubernetes. Do we really have to stick with uh, traditional firewalls? Is there a better way? And the answer is, obviously, uh, that there is, right? Between a combination of Talisco uh, and Istio, two projects that are very near and dear to the heart uh, 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 to Tigera. Uh, I mean, we brought to bear Calico, uh, the open source project, and we're heavily involved in the Istio project. With these two technologies, open source technologies, we can achieve that full interzone uh, visibility, right? We can uh, achieve layer three through layer seven security, and we can obviously limit the blast radius should there be an intrusion within the cluster. Uh, the you know question we'll often get is: Is it one or the other? Do I have to do Istio only? Do I have to do Calico only? Can I do one or the other? Um, and the answer is. Both together are what really give us uh, a strong sense of security. Layer 3 and 4, BGP IP routing, we can uh, allow Calico to handle that. But then for the HTTP applications, the Layer 7 protocol, that's where Istio really comes into the picture. And by virtue of the demo that we're going to get into in the, in the second here, um, we're going to highlight how the two technologies complement each other to give us that zero trust security. Uh, but before we dive into that, I did want to just give a primer to folks on how, uh, you know, we achieve these types of zone-based uh, or, or these types of network policies within Calic. And one of the key things we need to understand uh, in Kubernetes is, is the notion of labels. 
labels are a key uh, ingredient to how we can achieve this. So, and, and, and you know, again, let's also discuss the motivation for network policy, right? If we have, you know, N services within the cluster, you have N squared possible connections. Uh, as we know, only a fraction of those are actually necessary for the application. So any, uh, any, any of these paths that aren't used by our application are merely useful for an attacker, right? So what we really want to start to do is pare down the connectivity within the cluster to something a, a lot sparser, right? So for example, we know the front, front end load balancers don't communicate directly to the database. So that's the line of communication that we would want to go ahead and restrict and eliminate from within the cluster. Uh, there's a notion of namespace isolation, um, wherein, whereas one namespace can't communicate with another namespace. Um, and there's also finer grain isolation that we can achieve with Calico even within a namespace. So uh, some example use cases, right? Not, not a lot of folks, but some folks will actually deploy dev and test and prod instances together in the same cluster. Uh, typically, we'll see dev and test in one cluster and maybe production in a separate cluster. Uh, folks may have compliance issues uh, or, or requirements really around PCI, HIPAA. Um, you know, and that's really where you need some network policies to go ahead and prove to an auditor that you have these PCI zones uh, in your Kubernetes cluster. So one of the key concepts in how we achieve this is labels. And uh, for, uh, for most folks that, are, that have been using Kubernetes for any appreciable amount of time, we all know uh, and leverage labels extensively, right? But for those that are perhaps new to Kubernetes, new to try and understand how policies work in this environment, labels are essentially uh, a key value pair that is totally user-defined um, that you can apply to just about any um, aspect of a Kubernetes deployment, right? whether it's an application, it's a namespace itself, uh, and there's no limit to how many key value pairs you can create. Uh, the nice thing about labels is that you can actually reference by their labels, and we'll see how that plays an important role um, within network policy. Uh, when we're using uh, labels, we can go ahead and use uh, equality-based uh, operators, uh, we can do set membership, or for example, we can create a query that says, give me all the pod, pods that equal this label uh, and not this other label, for example. And they, they really are a key part of the network policy, right? So, um, you know, when we go ahead and show you how to actually create the network policy here in a bit, we're going to see this notion of pod selectors and also namespace label selectors. So let's go ahead and take a look at a sample network policy. So first and foremost, you're going to notice the API version uh, of type network policy kind. Uh, it could be any Kubernetes construct. It could be a deployment, a stateful set, a daemon set. Uh, in this case, we're focusing on the network policy. We can see that it's going to apply to, for example, a specific namespace. We can also create global uh, network policies with Calico. And when we go ahead and select uh, or talk about the pod selector where we match labels, uh, notice in this case we're going to apply this policy to any pods that has the label role colon database in there. So these blue pods, this, these pods are going to be the ones that actually have this policy applied to them. And what we're basically going to do is we're going to go ahead and allow ingress for many front end pods on a specific um, and by creating a policy like this, you know, we have a default deny paradigm cluster by virtue of a policy. Um, we're going to eliminate any other traffic that can go ahead and hit this pod, right? So this is a basic network policy, uh, and we're going to see how we can now apply this uh, by means of a demo. And before we dive into the demo, I'd love to stop for a Q&A. Um, please feel free to uh, enter any sort of questions into the chat, and we can go ahead and uh, handle them. And we'll allow about 30 seconds. There's a lag between actually punching in the question and myself seeing it. So we'll give you all a few seconds here to go ahead and ask questions if you have any.
Yeah, please feel free to uh, ask anything you want. Um, we are not the kind of people that uh, seed fake questions. So if we don't have any questions, we will move on and get into the demo. So we'll give it a few more, more seconds, as Eddie said. <clears throat> Okay. Well, okay. I think we're ready for a demo. Okay, let's do it. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, and switch from the uh, right deck deck to my screen. Michael, you want to let me know when you can uh, see my screen? It's all good. Okay, awesome. So let's go ahead and dive into the demo. Um, so by the end of the demo, we're going to have a scenario where we have Calico uh, by virtue of Felix um, locking down layer two and layer three, and then also locking down Istio or layer seven applications by virtue of Istio and uh, the Tecassi's, uh integration that we've built here at Tidera. So what we're going to start is with a very basic scenario. We have one single Kubernetes cluster. We have a couple of namespaces. We're going to have several pods in each environment. And it's in a default Kubernetes deployment, uh, this basically means, it means that everything can talk to everything. Right? So not ideal, um, but we're going to see how we can go ahead and uh, whittle this down to just having the connectivity that we actually want. And for good measure, I'm going to throw in an attacking pod in there, and we're going to leverage uh, the favorite hacking tool, kubectl, to go ahead and, and actually execute some ping and see what we have access to um, within the cluster. So one of the first things we're going to go ahead and do is drop namespace, more than nice namespace, actually label-based isolation, right? So what I mean is we're going to try to replicate within each, within each one of these namespaces the basic three-tiered architecture that we've leveraged on-premise, right? You may have a DMZ zone, you know, the front-end apps, the customer apps that are facing the Internet, for example, where we have the and then the back-end apps. So notice that the attacking pod actually was able to ingrain itself within this restricted zone, right? So we have a couple namespaces, and we're going to create some policies, and we'll actually see what these policies look like. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at that. So if we head over to a console, I have my demo scenario here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and exec into the attacking pod, and we're just going to see what we have access to. Right? So uh, from the attacking pod, uh, that red pod in the demo slide, we're going to notice that we have access to everything. Right? Not ideal. So let's go ahead and actually secure by means of network policies, Calico policies to be specific, um, this environment a bit more. So I created some policies. Notice the policies popped up here in Tigera Secure. And if I go ahead and run the same command one more time, we're going to notice that we've gone ahead and limited the scope of what that attacking pod actually has access to, right? So we're going to see some failed pings here. Uh, but let's go ahead and take a look at what this policy actually looks like. So let's go ahead and take a look at a policy here in Tigera Secure. We're going to notice, similarly to what we described in, in the, um, in the, in the uh, slide, we're going to apply this to any pod that has a label firewall zone equals restricted. And we're basically going to allow ingress only from a couple of various endpoints that are labeled with uh, very specific labels, right? If we had to, we could also create egress policies uh, within Tigera Secure. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at what these labels actually look like. So, for example, if I take a look at the actual database YAML, we're going to notice that the database uh, that I have running in my cluster, if I go to the top of the deployment descriptor, actually has these labels. Um, so, for example, this label is the key one that we're leveraging within this policy. And by going ahead and setting up these, uh, these policies, we've now achieved some better uh, security. Um, basically, we've gone from a wide open environment to this environment, right? So we have we still have access um, from the customer 
you know, uh, you know, the database can access the customer pods if necessary because those are in the DMZ zone. We have access to the summary because that's the tier that actually needs access. And the database can also reach out to the front end since the front end is internet facing, right? But what if we wanted to go ahead and employ a specific policy to, uh, all intents and purposes, punch a hole in this firewall, right? This would be essentially what a firewall change would look like. Um, how would we do that? Are we going to leverage the static IPs? I mean, we know that that's a non-starter within Kubernetes. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and leverage labels to go ahead and uh, facilitate what would be a firewall zone. And at this point, uh, if I'm talking to a prospect, a customer, and we talk about how long it takes to create a firewall zone, uh, I, I usually get eye rolls or laughs or, or something, some combination of the two because it is something that can take quite a bit of time in, in a lot of uh, different shops out there. So let's go ahead and facilitate this network zone policy here. So the first thing we're going to go ahead and do is actually highlight that at the, uh, at the beginning we don't have access to that database pod. So the bank info pod, as described here, does not have access to database pod. So we're going to go ahead and do our uh, firewall change here. Created a policy. Let's go ahead and take a look at that policy. And we're notice that we're now going to, again, apply it to the database. And we're going to allow any app that has the bank info label to have access to it. Okay? So went ahead and created that namespace or that, that policy. Going to run this again. And we notice that immediately we now, the bank info pod, has access to the database pod. Okay? And one of the key features of Tigera Secure is this notion of tiering, right? Where Basically, we can group policies, we can apply RBAC to these groups of policies, and we can uh, evaluate the policies in such a way that, uh, you know, very important policies will get evaluated first, and will never get overridden by underlying policies, right? So, for example, because this was the namespace to namespace policy, it may be a policy that your security team would want to enable. Um, we allow the platform team its own tier here. And anything the platform team does uh, in terms of policy would never override anything that the security team does, right? So this is basically policy tiering and how we are able to, you know, give different teams within uh, your, your, your company um, different access to creating these policies, right? So a key feature that really separates Tiger Secure from even just open source Calico. Let's keep moving. We still have this notion of the attacking pod, right? So um, still need to do something about the attacking pod. So we want to go ahead and prove or, or first simulate what this attacker actually has access to. And then the end result is that we actually want to be able to lock down that attacking pod. Let's go ahead and do that. So if we go ahead and take a look at what that attacking pod has access to, we're notice that that pod actually has Curl HTTP access to that pod, right? So we are, you know, moments away from, you know, the usernames and passwords getting exfiltrated out into the, the, the World Wide Web. Not an ideal scenario. So let's go ahead and lock this down. So we're going to go ahead and create a policy, uh, a network policy, to go ahead and uh, lock that. The first thing we're going to do is going to go ahead and toggle Istio. And toggling Istio basically means we already have Istio control plane running in the namespace within the cluster. What we're basically going to do is add a label to the Yaobank namespace. And what that does is it basically kicks the pod and injects a couple of containers into that pod. So we're going to, first and foremost, uh, anybody familiar with the Istio architecture knows that we inject the Envoy pod. This is essentially the proxy that handles all the TLS and all the cool service mesh features that Istio allows for. But in uh, our situation, we're also going to inject a second container, uh, a container we refer to as Dicastis, built here at Tigera. And this container basically uh, pushes policy driven by Calico into Envoy. So for example, if I go ahead and take a look at the, um, at the pods that we've uh, now kicked, we'll notice that these pods, Whereas they once had one container, they now have three containers, right? So the Casties uh, and Envoy have been injected into these pods. 
And if we take a look at the labels for the namespaces, we notice that really the key thing here is that Gelbank now has issue injection enabled. Okay? Uh, that still doesn't mean that we fully eliminated the, uh, the attack vector, right? If I run this attack, we'll notice that we still have access to the attack. And the reason for that is that this attacking pod was able to go ahead and pull the search off the box, inject it into themselves, and be able to execute the curl, right? So um, anybody that's worked with Kubernetes knows that um, it's fairly straightforward to just pull the pods and mount them in as volumes. volumes. And if you go ahead and take a look at, at the uh, at the actual curl command, we'll see how that is actually the case. So if I actually run this command, we'll notice that we're actually curling the database and we're actually pulling the certs and leveraging those to actually do the successful HTTP uh, curl command. Um, what we've done with Tigera is this notion of multi-factor authentication. So certs are a key factor uh, in determining trust, but the other thing, uh, the other identity that we leverage within Tiger Secure is the notion of a Kubernetes identity, right? So let's go ahead and create a policy to actually start leveraging that Kubernetes policy. So I'm going to go ahead and create a policy here. If we actually take a look at the policy here, we'll notice that before we were leveraging labels, now we're going to start leveraging a service account name and we're going to get very specific and allow get to very specific paths, uh, HTTP paths, right? So what this basically does is if we run this command again, the deploy attack, we'll notice that we're now getting 403s. And what happened is, okay, yeah, you may have the search, um, you may have lifted the search off the box, is actually allowed to connect to us by virtue of this policy that we created and validating with Kubernetes that, yeah, this, this service account actually belongs to this pod that's trying to execute this request, right? So again, a form of two-factor authentication, if you will, uh, where the cert isn't the only um, identity that, uh, that's really going to get it to you through the front door, okay? So I think for virtue of this demo, we were able to highlight how Calico leverages you know, or, or locks down layer two, layer three policy, um, and how Istio allows, you know, a finer grained HTTP access um, to uh, in the cluster, right? And between the two, we're able to get the full uh, security within our cluster. So with that in mind, I'd uh, love to leave it open to questions if, if there's any sort of questions. And also, uh, I'll hand it back to you, Michael. Yeah, so while we're waiting for the questions to come in, um, as he mentioned, there is about a 30-second lag when you enter the question before we see it. So if you guys have any questions, please enter them now. And while you're doing that, I'll inform you about the upcoming webinars. So the webinar that was originally scheduled for today about Kubernetes Helm and network security best practices at scale will actually be happening uh, later this month on the 24th, uh, Wednesday. Uh, we had uh, our presenter, Brandon, injured his hand, and he was going to be doing so much demo work that he couldn't type, and so he couldn't do the webinar today. So, but he's, uh, he's healing, and we'll be ready for the 24th. So, so do join us for that. That webinar is up and ready, and you can register for that now. Um, and also, um, if, if many of you have attended these webinars in the past, you know that we promote this webinar heavily because it's just a great webinar uh, with AWS, Tigera, and Atlassian. It's an Atlassian case study about how um, AWS, about how Atlassian moved to the cloud, uh, their applications in a secure manner uh, using Tiger and AWS. It's a really, the people from Atlassian are great, and it's a, it's a great presentation to watch. So do, do get a chance if you can. So um, we still don't have any questions. Okay, so you guys are apparently all experts on Istio and security and Kubernetes. That's good to know. So, um, so well, Eddie, I uh, would like to thank you so much for, for jumping in and, uh, and presenting. And um, if you guys have any um, questions, feel free to go ahead and, um, you know, we have a contact us form on our website. We also have a demo request if you'd like to get a more personalized demo, have a meeting with us and see this. Oh, we have a question that just came in. Eddie, uh, do you see that, Ed?
So the question is, um, what prevents the attacker from running these commands themselves? In other words, what is the security footprint for Tiger itself? Oh, okay, good question. So, um, so in terms of the identity, we go ahead and to the search, the service account identity. In terms of being able to actually create the commands, I'm leveraging the admin conf for Kubernetes, right? Uh, that's generally not a best practice, right? You don't hand out admin conf to all of your developers. You have that pretty locked down. And you would implement some notion of RBAC within your cluster, right? And maybe tie that back to uh, an LDAP or something like that. So that would also be another aspect of uh, another strengthening factor uh, to your to your uh, cluster. Uh, great question, though. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the thing. Um, Drew Drew um, Etzel brought up in the webinar two weeks ago, really, that uh, I had not heard before, which was that um, that that really we run inside of Kubernetes. That that we're not just some application running. So we're really in, deeply integrated with Kubernetes. Um, so. And that's uh, we leverage all the security there too for for that. As far as I know, I'm in marketing. Okay, well, um, if there aren't any further questions, maybe give it another second or two, because we do have some time. And um, then we will go ahead and wrap up. So I'd like to thank you all for attending. Like I mentioned, um, uh, the presentation will be available again on demand. If you would like a copy of the deck. If you could just send an email to reply at tigera.io, uh, that will go to the correct person, and we will take care of uh, getting you a copy of the deck if you'd like that, or more information. And once again, you can always go to our website, tigera.io slash demo. Um, Eddie, thank you for, for presenting, and everyone, uh, thank you for attending. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your Wednesday, and we will see you in two weeks, where we will be talking about Kubernetes, Helm, and best practices at scale. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you all.